Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, live virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with Hernando County Extension, and we were not able to have our regularly scheduled guest with us today. She has some family issues, but fortunately, I was able to, to line up Jamie Doherty from Lake County Extension to kind of jump in for a few minutes and help us out with some questions here. So, Jamie, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Bill. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing just great. And this is your first time on um, StreamYard here and streaming to Facebook Live. I know that you were on one of the clinics with us in the past when we we're still using mm -hmm. Zoom. Yep. And this is a lot more fun <laughs> because, because we have we both have dogs. So if you guys start to hear dogs in the background, you can start you know trying to guess from the bark. Is it Jamie's dog? Is it one of mine? So that's one of the joys of working from home, I guess. But um, for anybody who's tuning in with us today, if you have any kind of lawn and garden or plant questions, just go ahead and type your question in the uh, chat underneath the live video box on either Facebook or YouTube. And if, specifically, if you have any tree questions, because Jamie is the tree expert, and she has all the uh, arboriculture certifications, do you have all the certifications or does it well, not yet? I'm, I'm an ISA certified arborist and I have been since 2009 or 10. I've honestly lost track at this point. Um, I want to become board certified master arborist, but you know, I figured I'd finish the PhD first and then do that one. <laughs> yeah. My to-do list kind of looks the same. I don't have PhD in the mix, but I have different certifications that I need to work on getting. And yeah and taking the test and getting it done. Um, I can tell everybody that a lot of times when we get a question in our office, if you have a question or a problem with a tree, feel free to contact us, give us a call, send us an email, send us pictures, good close up pictures, good far away pictures of what's going on with the tree. And a lot of times we can give you an idea of what's wrong with it. But a lot of times if your question has to do with, is this tree safe? or not safe? Does it need to come down? Uh, can it be saved somehow with, you know, corrective pruning? A lot of times we tell you that you need to hire an arborist and have them come out and physically look at it. Because mm -hmm. right now we can't do that. And I'm not a certified arborist. And even if I was, I can't do um, uh, safety checks or safety certifications. You're going to, you may need to deal with a certified arborist because they're the experts and a lot of times you have to actually physically look at a tree to determine if it's safe or not. So, yeah. And as an extension agent, I am a certified arborist, but I'm not allowed to go look at people's individual trees. So if you send me a picture and I can tell it's unsafe, I'll tell you to contact an arborist to remove it. Um, otherwise I'll also tell you to, you know, if I can't help you with photos, I'll tell you to contact an arborist and how to go about that as well. And if you're looking for information on how to prune your tree or something, I actually have a lady that's coming in next week that wants to know how to prune a crepe myrtle. And I said, why don't you stop by? We have crepe myrtles outside. I'll show you exactly what to do. So <laughs> there she goes again. <laughs> you can do it live in person. <laughs> so ironically, I'm having tree work done outside right now <laughs> and the stump grinder is coming. So my dog's just a little excited. Oh, um, and it's just because That's I needed more equipment than I had and was capable of doing on my own. <laughs> what, you don't have your own stump grinder in the garage? No, no, okay. those are expensive and huge. And how frequently do you need a stump grinder if you're not actually doing like contractor work? <laughs> not very often. And I know from mm -hmm. having owned chainsaws in the past, I wouldn't use it very often. And then if the chainsaw sits in the shed for like a year or two, of course, when I need it and I go to start it, it will not start. Exactly. That's why I actually don't even own a chainsaw right now. I haven't I'll needed one. Point owning a gas one, because when you do need it, it won't start. You have to take it to the shop, get it tuned up, because it just has really, really tiny gas lines and they plug up. The little carburetor, it plugs up. If you want to keep your chainsaw in good running order, you need to skip, put on your calendar once a month, go out there and start it. Run it for a few minutes, make sure it runs okay, run some gas through it. 
And then yeah. hopefully after a big storm or a hurricane, when you need it, it will run for you. But otherwise, if let, I know from personal experience, you let it sit in the garage for two years, I guarantee you it will not start right up. Yeah. Well, my parents actually have an electrical one and I borrowed it once and it was way too much fun. Oh. I'm muted. Just noticed. Okay. <laughs> um, I was going to say uh, my family, my parents have an electrical chainsaw and I borrowed it once and it was quite a lot of fun. And I probably took out more trees than I was originally planning on because I was having so much fun with it. Um, and the nice side about that is you don't have the issues with the gas lines, but you do just have to remember to keep it charged. And if you have a power outage on a hurricane, that can be a bit of a problem. Yeah, it can be. I have more um, electric equipment now. I even have a battery operated lawnmower, which I'm very happy with and it runs just great. And yeah. I don't stink up the garage with gasoline because I don't have to store gas. We have four of them at the Discovery Garden in Lake County, three for a research project and one for smaller areas that the tractor can't go. Um, and I kind of regret the fact that two years ago, I bought a brand new gas lawnmower right before, you know, the electric ones became affordable and readily available. And I can't, I just, I can't get rid of it yet. It's, it was too expensive. I can't replace it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I had to get one a year or two ago and um, looked at the battery operated ones, and I'm very happy with it. Um, well, you need to keep that blade sharp, very important. But other than that, yeah. that's just great. Well, and it depends on where you live as well. So when I bought my lawnmower, I lived out on the sand hills down in Lake Wales, and I needed something more powerful and more easy to maneuver over tough terrain, and the electrical ones didn't work for me. But now in most residential areas within my county, electric ones should be just fine. Yeah, most people that live in a subdivision, a subdivision size lawn, electric one is all you need. Mm -hmm. Now, I was in Edinburgh at the Botanic Garden last year, and I saw one of the basically Roomba versions of a lawnmower, and it was the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> just go out and mow the lawn all by itself. <laughs> I saw one near the office, and I would drive past the house going to and from work. It was right on Spring Hill Drive and they had one and I'd see it running around the front yard uh, during the day. And it really is just like a Roomba and mm -hmm. it runs around your yard and automatically cuts the grass for you. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's important if you want nice turf to have that grass cut at regular intervals to keep it healthy. So it's a good mm -hmm. way to do it if you're busy. Yeah. Technology, isn't it great? It's just crazy. It just, it's amazing how much it's changed in my lifetime. It just, I feel like it went from zero to a thousand. <laughs> exactly. And now we're on StreamYard and we're on Zoom mm -hmm. and we're teaching virtually, which I know is convenient for a lot of people because not everybody is free necessarily at 10 a.m. on a Thursday morning to come to our office. So now we can come to you. And you can watch this over and over if you'd like. You can watch it when you get home from work at the end of the day. And I know that we've gotten a lot of really good um, comments from people about trying to make our classes and our information more available and user-friendly for people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So guys, I definitely if, you find, questions, if you have yeah, any questions, I, go ahead and type them in. I don't see say I find that lots really of people have. like the online system now. Yeah, so, it is Will, very, it's very convenient for a lot of people. Will I see questions or are you going to be the one that sees questions on this? No, ma'am. You should see questions on there also. So okay. somebody type in good morning or hi, Jamie, or something like that. So at least. So I know how this what's works. going on here. <laughs> because I could see up at the top how many people are on. And then how many little thumbs up and hearts we've gotten. And. Oh, I don't see that. Maybe it's because I don't have a StreamYard account. No, you should be able. Well, yeah, you probably can't see how many people are on there. Mm. But let me go ahead. And um, if you have any questions, lawn and garden related or anything else, 
here is our phone number. So feel free to give us a call. If you call the office, you will probably get a hold of Teresa. And Teresa is more than happy to help you out. Uh, she can forward questions to me. We do have master gardeners that are starting to help out at the office now, which is a huge help. They're able to answer a lot of questions and get back with people and help you help to explain how to go about doing a soil test. Uh, I know that we're starting to have a lot more turf questions and turf problems. You have problems with take all root rot over in Lake County? I've only had one issue come in so far. Which uh, oh, with all right. the rain, I've been a little surprised that there hasn't been more of a problem, but only it one. It can be seasonal. And a lot of times this time of year in the fall, what, like near the end of summer and the rains have stopped, we'll start to get outbreaks of it. And we've started to get a lot more samples at the office to look at. And we're able to look at it under the microscope. And if you have really obvious take all root rot, we can see it and then tell you what to do about it. It's a tough tough disease to deal with in a St. Augustine lawn. The mm -hmm. most important thing I could tell you is you need to cut your grass high. St. Augustine needs to be cut three and a half to four inches high. If you're cutting it two or two and a half inches high, that's very stressful for your grass and you're going to have a lot of problems. So, so go and get that lawnmower or talk to your lawn service and figure out how to cut that, cut it high, basically. So your grass is going to be a lot less stressed. You're going to have fewer weed problems, fewer disease problems. So Jamie, can you see the comments here? I can. <laughs> Just like magic. So can the dog. <laughs> yeah. So can the dog. Stop. Okay. And we can show them too. So good morning, Summer. How are you doing? Oh, well, that's so neat. <laughs> I know. Isn't this great? And Lee's on here also. Good morning. How are you? If you guys have any burning questions or anything you'd like to ask about your lawn, your garden, please be sure to ask all the really difficult tree questions now while Jamie's on. Because oh boy, we all work together really well. And so, if you send me a difficult tree question, or I, I don't know what it is, but I'm not really positive, I'll share it with Jamie and get her ideas also. She will send me questions every once in a while. All of us have different areas of expertise and work very well together. We need to do a lot more question sharing or something where we can share them. Because if worse comes to worse, we have the researchers and the mm -hmm. specialists up there in Gainesville. So we tell people that we'll get your question one way or the other. Um, it may take a little time. We may have to send it to a few people until somebody says, I know what that is. And. This is what you should do about it. So here we go. We have a question. Lee says there's too much rain here in Broward. My plants are not happy. Yeah, I think over the last few weeks, there was a front that kind of sat on Florida. And we got a little bit of rain here in Hernando County. But it looked like from the radar that you're getting a lot more rain south of here. So... You know, we can't do a whole lot about the rain. We can advise people and tell them what to do with their irrigation because that you can control, but not a whole lot you can do about the rain. No. Most plants are going to adapt to it and do well. Enjoy it while it's here because pretty soon we're going to be in dry season. And then people are going to be running their irrigation all the time. And yeah, We had actually an outbreak of Phytophthora root rot in our discovery garden as a result of rain and poor drainage in one of our areas. Oh, what, so, what did you have it on? Uh, we had it going through a bunch of legustrum shrubs. We had to take out like 10. <clears throat> we see that on viburnums and a lot of hedge bushes. And what happens is I think in some instances, people will have hedges around their house. And every year or twice a year, you want to freshen up the mulch and make everything look good. So you throw a little bit more mulch on, a little bit more mulch. And then over 10 years, you end up with about six inches of mulch. It turns to concrete. The rain will go down and wet the soil, but it doesn't have a chance to dry out. So if we have a rainy summer, your ligustrums or viburnums are sitting in mud all summer long. 
the mulch is too thick and it's compacted and that people's bushes will start to die completely from phytophthora or some other kind of root rot because i just got we got some pictures through our facebook page from a mm -hmm. late row of viburnums i think and some of them were completely dead no. Well, in ours, yeah, so we had it where they sort of showed signs that something was wrong and then they just died. And then it just kept moving down the row, which is, you know, similar to that. Mm -hmm. So my garden technician out there was cutting them down and he said, come on out. We don't know what's wrong. We're, we're ripping them out because it's whatever is happening is spreading. So I went out and looked at the inside and you could see that rot was happening. So I actually contacted Gainesville and asked, um, plant pathology, you know, what do I do? I was going to send it up. And they actually told me how I could grow the um, fungus myself to find out what it was. So that's what I did. I took a tree cut, what we call tree cookies. So it's just a cross section of the tree trunk that I could tell the fungus was in, put it in a dark plastic bag with a wet paper towel and tied it up for three days. And then I looked at what color mold grew. Oh, that's great. I haven't done that before. Mm -hmm. I'll have to get with you about that. Yeah. Like I said, we do have somebody who contacted us through Facebook <clears throat> with a picture of a couple of dead hedges. And one way you could tell it's a root rot problem is if your bush or hedge seems to die overnight and the entire thing, top to bottom, everything in between dies suddenly all at once, it's probably a root issue. If the leaves start to get brown spots or it starts to die, from one side or the top or the bottom and spreads bit by bit, it's probably um, a foliar fungal problem. And all these different hedges by the end of summer start to get leaf spots on them. We'll have people come yeah. in with 20 baggies with every plant they have in their yard and they all have leaf spots. It's like leaf spot, leaf spot, leaf spot. Well, I, I have a question for you, Bill, actually, that has come through me and I've put it on our online system for more help. But it was a boxwood shrub where literally half of it has died. The other half looks perfectly healthy. They've never fertilized it. The only water it gets is the rain. And the leaves go from green to a bright shade of red to brown. And we're trying soil tests, but I'm thinking a root problem, but I'm not sure exactly what's going on with that one. That may be a stem problem because if you look real closely at the structure of the bush, the part that's affected, if you kind of track back and go downwards, it's all probably attached to one main branch. And if you track that branch back down, the branch may be damaged. I've seen them snap or broken before. Uh, you could have a borer or some kind of twig borer or some kind of canker or disease on just that one branch, in which case the whole branch is gonna to have to be removed and the rest should fill in pretty well. But that's probably what I would look at first because a lot of shrubs are gonna be like two or three or four main branches mm -hmm. out of the ground. And if it's an overall root problem, it's gonna kill the whole thing top to bottom seemingly overnight and if it's just one branch, it's something that affected just that one branch. Thanks. But Sometimes when you get those pictures online, you forget the basics when you're out in the field. I'd have checked that if I was in the field. <laughs> so Deborah Sue is watching and she's one of our brand new master gardeners. So you, so she thinks you're a genius. That's great. Yay, thank you. That's really sweet. <laughs> we appreciate all, all the, the positive comments here. And hi everybody. And I wanna thank Summer for being the first person to post good morning and let me know that I could see things correctly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's a little hard because I know when you're on Zoom and you start screen sharing on Zoom, it's like you're blind. You can't see mm -hmm. people and you can't tell what's happening and you can't tell whose cameras are on or not and if somebody's raising their hand with a question. And... No, I think I like this better. This is great. Um, let's see, we have... Um, you can create banners. So there's our contact information. If that's you amazing. need to get in touch with me, just feel free to send me an email. That's definitely the best way to get in touch. If you're interested in what kind of classes we have coming up, if you just go to Hernando Extension 
all one word, dot com. That's a freestanding web page with a listing of all our upcoming classes, next week's plant clinic, as soon as I schedule it, everything that we have going on between myself, Lily Browning, who's our Florida friendly landscape person, and everybody else in the office. So that way you can put it on your calendar. We do classes here on Facebook. We do them through Zoom. We do them every way imaginable. We're probably one day going to be doing them on Microsoft Teams. Jamie, have you tried playing with Teams yet? I haven't. I've been on Teams. I haven't led a meeting on Teams, but I've been in meetings on Teams. Yeah, so see, we have even more platforms that we can play with and experiment with just to confuse everybody. But we try to, um, on Facebook, with our Facebook events, we try to put down all the information you need and where and how to tune in to be able to watch us live. And the nice thing is most of these things are also recorded, so you can watch them after the fact. Bill, Deborah's got a banana question. Um, it cut her off, though. I don't have the entire... Um, comment there. She has a long question. Okay. She does. So it looks like somebody's trying to use bananas as a wall to block wind. Um, it would not be my first plant choice to make a wind blocking wall. They're not super sturdy in the wind. Plus after they flower, they're going to die back. Yeah, um, you could put in a row of bananas. They are not the best. If you're putting in, if you want a specific wind block, they can get fairly tall if they do well and you have the right variety of bananas. They will block the wind, but they will get beat up in the process. Mm -hmm. um, and they do require quite a lot of water. So you want them near a water source, either where you can water them or close to, but not in um, a body of water where they can get their own water through the root system too. Yeah. And that do. might answer Summer's question. She needs to plant a banana. I actually have a dwarf Cavendish banana that I also need to get in the ground. And my plan for that is actually planting it where my downspout is from my house. So it gets a lot of extra water from the rain. That's smart. And if you plant it, close to or next to your rain barrel if you have one that's convenient for, mm -hmm. for extra irrigation i have some bananas in my backyard and it's tough when it's not raining a lot for me to keep them wet enough where they're really happy they're probably not as happy as they could be right now yeah and another thing about bananas to remember is they do want sun so if planting them close to your house make sure you're planting them on a side that does get direct sun at least for part of the day um, you don't want it to be in shade. It's not going to do anything for you. Yeah, so that's important. The north side of your house is going to be dark for all winter long. Uh, the west side of your house is a really, really tough place to live because during the summer, it gets that really intense, hot, burning afternoon sun. And that sun radiating off the west side wall of your house <laughs> is really tough. Uh, whatever kind of plants you're growing, so you need to think long and hard about what you're going to put on the west side of your house. Uh, the south side of your house is great. It's going to get sun all year long. And as a matter of fact, the south I have a south wall on the front of my house where I am going to be putting my um, patayas or dragon fruits up against the wall. Because even then, in the dead of winter, when it gets really cold, if it's sunny, that south wall is going to warm up during the day. And overnight, it's going to radiate that heat back and keep it a little bit warmer. And probably the best side of your house for growing anything is going to be the east side because it gets the nice first half of the day sun, not burning afternoon sun. So the east side of your house is always the easiest. Yeah. Place. Conveniently, the east side of my house is my backyard. Oh. So okay. that's where my vegetable garden is going in. And it looks like somebody's got leaf miners on their tomatoes. Yes, that sounds, leaf miners, I tell people, it looks like somebody took a little white pen and just scribbled all over the leaf because that's what it looks like. And a leaf miner is going to be a little immature, either fly, larva, or moth caterpillar. 
There's some of both. And what they do is they live in the center of the leaf and they tunnel around and they feed and they eat. And they're completely normal. If you have a citrus tree, you're going to have leaf miners. If you have a vegetable garden, you're going to have leaf miners on at least something. And if you only have a few leaf miners, they're really not a huge problem. Um, if they become a problem, like let's say you're growing tomatoes or cucumbers and you start to have a lot of leaf miners, the best control for that is something called spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. And you can, commercial growers have been using it for a number of years. It's organic. It's produced from a naturally occurring bacteria. And the one homeowner product that I know that you could buy either at a big box store, or I know you could buy it online. You could buy it on Amazon. That's where I buy all my stuff anymore is from Amazon. It's just the easiest. <laughs> Magically shows up at the front door in one or two days too. But uh, the homeowner product is called Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. And I didn't make that name up. The company did. So if you look that up, it's that it's called leaf miners. It's to use. Just follow, definitely follow the directions. And that should solve your leaf miner problem. Oh, uh, we got three questions. So I'm I know. I was looking it up. Um, so dogwoods that flourish, you're over in... Marion County, so all, both those trees should be fine. Do you know about how old they were when this happened? Now, black bark, it sounds like you might have gotten a fungal infection with black bark. Large knots under the growth, not a gall. Definitely sounds more like a disease. Let me see what's in this area. And she said she's had them there for about 25 years. Oh, that could be it. So let me look up. Hang on. different trees and different landscapes but yeah red buds yard. and dogwoods you're looking at about a 25 year lifespan so if they were 25 years and then they got sick and died that's not abnormal just because they got old and they couldn't fight off basic infections like they would have been able to when they were younger and valerie's in marion county which is a little bit north of fernando county here so you can grow red buds and dogwoods there. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not sure how many issues they have up there. I know. Well, yeah, let me. Um, and I was wrong. Dogwood lifespan is 80 years, so the dogwoods dying is strange. The red buds dying wouldn't be. Let me see. Where's I know that here in Hernando mm -hmm. County, we are at the bare edge of red bud and dogwood huh. world. North of here, huh. they grow. And then the further north you go, the better they grow. Generally south of here, you're not going to be very successful with either no. red or dogwoods. And both frequently die here during the summer. Yeah. Well, there is a Florida native dogwood, um, the swamp dogwood, that you can grow a bit further south. But if you're talking about, you know, the typical flowering dogwood, you do, we are at that southern end. Yeah. Um, but if you... Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name. Valeria? Maybe. Um, if you have pictures of those issues, if you could email them to me, I could get a better idea of what exactly is going on. Um, I don't know that you maybe, even if they're, they've died, if you have any of the old pictures, I'd love to try to figure out what happened to them. Um, and I don't know, are you able to put my email address up there, Bill? Yes, I am. What is it? J. D A U G H E R T Y at UFL dot EDU. Okay, did I spell that correctly? Okay, there's Jamie's email. <laughs> Uh, 
And we have another tree question here, citrus tree. So Jamie, have you become an expert on citrus yet? I know no, but I do know a lot about transplanting trees. <laughs> um, six feet tall. So I'm unclear about the question here. Oh, can, I'm oh, sorry, I missed the word can. Yes, you can move it, but you have to do it properly. How tall the tree is doesn't matter. What you want to look at is the caliper. So the size of the trunk, about six inches above the ground. You need to have a root ball that has 12-inch diameter for every inch of caliber you have. And it's actually really quite difficult to move a larger tree um, because you have to dig down. You have to kind of not stand on the root ball as you dig, you need to wrap it well, and then you need to move it. It's not a case of just ripping it out of the ground um, because you are damaging the roots. And something to remember, if you you are transplanting a tree, do not prune the top of it because you're already pruning the roots. And that plant needs all of those leaves to photosynthesize to produce new roots once it gets moved. So you can give it a shot, but we can't guarantee it. <laughs> exactly. It is tough. And we have, we actually are taking some trees out of the garden and planting some new ones, which I'm super excited about because planting trees is one of my favorite things. So I'm going to be ordering some like nice big ball and burlap trees. So they're the ones that like get dug out of the ground. I like those. You're welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I look forward to that email. And I guess Deborah's going to give transplanting that citrus tree a shot. Yeah, just don't be too sad if it doesn't take. it. That can happen. Just when you're transplanting it, the big thing, never stand on the root ball because it's already getting stressed out. You don't want to break it because you're standing on it. Yeah, and I know some things tend to be a little easier to transplant. They tend to be a little tougher. I've transplanted crepe myrtles before. Oh, and they almost always survive. I mean, you, literally you can basically survive. cut a branch off a crepe myrtle and stick it in the ground and you'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. So crepe myrtles are tough. Citrus is more delicate. After you transplant it, you need to water it a okay, lot yes. daily or more than once a day. And citrus and also has that tricky little bit because citrus trees tend to be grafted. So you don't necessarily know exactly what the grafting rootstock was and how good that rootstock is for transplant. So it might be good for living in the soil and, you know, being, um, prevent diseases and pests from being an issue, but it might not transplant well. Yeah. Were you on that meeting recently um, where they talked about the new varieties of citrus? Really yes, I'm excited that about that. We might be using the Discovery Garden as a location to um, test them out. I'm excited too. I'm going to go out and buy a citrus tree and put it in my backyard now. Nice. Yeah, because they um, have those variety. new varieties. What was it? Eight different citrus varieties for, um, what did they call them? Dooryard citrus, I think is what yep. they were calling them. Yeah, and we're um, looking, they're looking at different research opportunities to kind of like test longevity and what kind of issues you might have with them. So I have a little bit of room at my discovery garden, so I've offered some space. So we're going to see if they take me up on it. Yeah. Do you know what the names of the varieties are yet? I know, um, sh I think Sugar Bell was the orange. Um, they mentioned. I am willing to bet the notebook that I wrote all that down is, in, is at my desk at work because that's where I tend to put things. I don't have them all memorized. Let me see if we can find that email real quick. Maybe I can tell you, hang on. Okay, yeah, I was gonna contact them and um, order some, because I definitely want a lemon tree, but I was always hesitant before because with citrus greening, you can still, you can go to a lawn and garden center, you can go um, to a big box store and still buy citrus. You can plant it, it will grow. But if it gets greening, there's nothing you can do about it. Greening will kill it. And we have less and less dooryard homeowner citrus here in Hernando County. I'm sure that goes all over. Um, but now these are varieties that will still get greening, but they're resistant to it. They'll still survive and look healthy. They'll flower, they'll get fruit. And they've had a lot of success with them so far.
Do you know on this? I'll, stick, on I'll this have stick, to get it to you later. I found the video, but I'd have to sift through 30 minutes to find the exact location where they actually gave us the list. Okay. Well, I, I've been meaning to contact them anyway. And um, I think that we definitely need to have some kind of class on that because I know that we have a lot of people in our county who would love to grow citrus. Many of them had it, it got greening and it died. Um, and they, yeah, I've had literally every citrus issue that's come in. One of the things that's been wrong with it is greening. Yeah. And greening kind of overshadows everything else. In the past, you'd have to be an expert at all the different fungal diseases it got and fruit diseases and insect pests. And you know, when a plant has all the insects named after it, that's a problem because citrus does have citrus whitefly and citrus mealybug and citrus psyllid, but greening kind of overshadowed all that because if you have greening, your tree's not gonna survive and not much you could do. You know, we have a lot of people that follow us here from other counties and mm -hmm. Sarah lives in zone 10. So we have a lot of people from South Florida. Yeah, and um, so your mango tree, Summer, your mango tree, it, you, let's see, you have a Congo Domingo tree to plant. Um, I would put it in the ground rather than keep it in a pot. It'll do better. Um, and you're in zone 10, so you're in the perfect location for it. So find a sunny spot, put it in the ground. Boy, I, now, when I, you take it out of the pot, if you notice the roots have moved around and started to kind of wrap around um, the pot, if you can kind of pull them apart a little bit, that's better. And if you can't, you can even kind of cut the sides to stimulate that root growth because otherwise the roots can keep growing in a circle and that can just cause problems as it grows. And I know with commercial growers down there in Miami and Homestead that grow uh, mangoes and avocados commercially, they grow like weeds down there. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. fast. How goes the hemp program is the question from Tampa. <laughs> We do have a multi-county agent over here. His name is Matt Smith, and he is in charge of all that. So if you contact our office, uh, Teresa can give you his phone number. I don't have it handy here with me, but she'll be more than happy to put you in contact with Matt Smith. And he is our county's representative for the um, hemp program. He can answer all your questions with that. All right, so a follow-up for Summer, because she asked about root space for her um, plant. Um, with any tree, the more root space it has, the better, but um, mangoes aren't particularly massively spreading root systems, so you can give it a little bit of a smaller space, but it might limit the height that it actually grows to. And I know if you live down in the greater homestead area because of your soils down there, you want to amend the soil if you can, work in a lot of compost, a lot of organic matter in the spot, all depending on exactly what kind of soil you're dealing with, where you're going to plant it. If Because the uh, organic matter and compost is really going to help benefit even if you have a sandy soil. But I know in the homestead area, you have that really bizarre, weird, sticky clay and limestone rock soil. And I know many years ago before uh, people, when they would want to plant a tree, they would create the hole with a stick of dynamite. We don't recommend that now because your neighbors are probably not going to be too keen on that. They have other ways of digging holes uh, and planting trees, but you probably want to use uh, a lot of organic matter. And yeah, use an auger or a shovel for planting trees and digging the hole. And I'm just looking, I'm going to go through that video real quick because it looks like there's a lot of interest in the dooryard citrus. So I'm going to find that real quick and get, get right back. Yeah. Um, everybody follow us on Facebook because um, we will, I will contact them and try to get one of the researchers who's actually doing all the work on these greening resistant varieties and rootstocks and what varieties they have and the names of them and how well they grow. And we'll definitely plan a class on that. Because like I said, I'm very interested in getting a lemon tree and maybe a uh, orange tree and planting them myself in my own backyard. <clears throat> so um, I found it. So I, I can read them out if you want. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. People can jot it down. Um, 
Sugar Bell is one. Hang on. It's, let's see. I remember Sugar that. Bell. Sugar Bell is the orange, the Mandarin orange. It is. Hang on. This is not as easy to navigate as I would like it to be. Okay, there's Sugar Bell. They apparently talked about Sugar Bell for a while. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Oh, wait, what just happened? No, that's just breeding efforts. Sugar Bell's the only one they actually listed. Otherwise, they just said there was one variety um, each of several. So they have one grapefruit, one lemon, two mandarins, one camello, and one sweet orange. Um, but the they only have one that's currently available to the public. Yeah, so we will look into, we need to have a class together on that because I know there's a lot of interest over here to be a good topic. Yeah, I think that'd be good. Yeah. yeah. So Summer said, thanks, amending the soil is my next question. She is in Sandy Pinellas. So I know well, that normally we don't recommend amending the soil before you plant a tree like an oak tree or a red bud or something like that. It's mm -hmm. going to be big and it's going to have to live in the sand anyway. But with things like bananas, uh, papayas, and I would probably do it even with a mango. If you're able to work in, in a large area, a lot of organic matter, those trees are a little needy and greedy and they like the organic matter. They like the extra fertilizer. They like the extra water. And that's probably going to give you a healthier tree because you really want it to grow and flower and get fruit and keep the fruit going until it's all the way ripe. Mm -hmm. So you should do well if you're in zone 10 in Pinellas. Um, mangoes, yeah. well, no problem there. It should be fine. And if you want, I mean, one thing you can do is you could almost kind of like, quote unquote, pot it in the ground too, where you just kind of dig out, I don't know, like a three by three square that goes down maybe another like three feet. So like three cubic feet. And then kind of mix that soil in with um, in-ground soil mixtures to actually help to amend that. And then it kind of will gradually go out of that, but it gives it a nice area of good nutrients to access as well. So I know we didn't answer the question about, can you use spinosad on citrus in containers for leaf miner? Yes. Yes, you can. And like I said, if you have citrus, you're always going to have some leaf miner. If you only have one or two or just a few leaves, you really don't need to worry about it too much. Uh, leaf miners can be a problem if you start to get a lot of leaves affected, in which case you want to use spinosad. Spinosad is quite honestly about the only control that works really well on uh, leaf miners because it actually goes in the leaf to where the leaf miner is. Everything else tends to sit on the outside of the leaf and isn't gonna control the leaf miner in the center. So yes, yeah, Sugar Bell is a mandarin orange for the new citrus. And when we were in that presentation, somebody asked about, how do I tell people how to get it in this step? I just Googled it really quick and immediately found a nursery that would ship me one. All I had to do is give them my credit card number and they'd be happy to sell it to me and put it on a truck and send it here. I just haven't had a chance to, to order mm -hmm. one. Yet. So Phyllis says that's a great discussion about citrus trees. Yeah, like I said, I know a lot of people, uh, we probably have a lot of pent up interest and pent up demand because of citrus greening. We haven't like not recommended citrus, but we have to kind of caution everybody. If you do buy and plant a tree and it gets greening, it will die. And there's nothing you could do about that. So Phyllis said a lot of snowbird neighbors because people move here to Florida from up north. And what do they want? They want a citrus tree in their backyard so they can pick citrus every morning and they want a palm tree. And they have no idea how to grow either one so it's kind of um, job security for us. Yeah. <laughs> Between those two and people's lawns that they don't know how to grow or deal with, 
that really is job security for us. So Deborah Sue has a tough question here. What are your thoughts on the use of biochar in soil when mixed compost or worm castings or both for gardens and when planting trees? Well, if you're planting trees, like it depends on the trees you're planting. Like Bill was saying earlier, you don't want to do a ton of different amendments to soil for a tree that's going to get large and needs to be able to spread out. You need to pick a tree that's going to work for where you are. Um, so that's that right tree, right place, or right plant, right place. So selecting for your area. Um, uh, and worm castings, I mean, you don't need to do a bunch of composting and fertilizer once a tree is established anyway. Um, again, it depends on what kind of tree we're talking about and how big it's going to get. Um, and one thing, I don't know if you've noticed this, Bill, but I've had a lot of people come in mentioning that they've used worm castings in their garden and then their plants start to fail. And I do a soil test and the pH is just skyrocketing in how high it is. Have you noticed an issue with the worm castings? Not with worm castings, but I know that if you get composted cow manure, that naturally has sky high pH. And if you work a truckload into your vegetable garden, it's your pH is going to go really high. And then after six months or a year, drop back down to wh whatever level it was at before. So sometimes uh, either worm castings or cow manure can change the pH. Generally, if you're making homemade compost in a compost bin or a compost pile, it generally does not affect your pH. Yeah, I... It Let's see what else was there. But I'm really no expert on biochar. I would think that it's not going to hurt anything in a system like a vegetable garden where your plants are growing in a limited area. It's just the reason why we don't recommend amending the soil for, let's say, planting an oak tree, a maple tree, uh, a big palm in your front yard, something like that. Over time, its roots are going to go all over the place, and most of the roots are going to be in the sand anyway. So, yeah, and you can notice a decline in the tree's health from when the roots are in that amended area to when it starts spreading because it became accustomed to the nutrient level, and now it's got to adapt to significantly less nutrients. And you don't want to fertilize a full-grown oak tree. That's just, there's way too much. That's just not practical. No, all the, a lot of things, once they get established in your yard, an oak tree, a maple tree, some other large tree, many times your hedge bushes, your viburnums, ligustrums, things like that, they really don't need a lot of additional fertilizing, and they really don't need a lot of additional irrigation either, unless we're in the middle of a really devastating drought. They're going to get by just fine on natural rainfall. So yeah, Phyllis said that she did have to remove a big grapefruit tree from her backyard this past season. I know yeah, that over the last that. couple of years we've had we have fewer and fewer citrus questions over time. Yeah, it's the I mean the one nice thing about greening is it once you know how to identify it, it's really easy to identify. Yeah, and we can tell from looking at it that it probably has greening. But we can't say for sure without sending it off to be tested. Mm -hmm. And greening looks, has mm -hmm. the same symptoms as nutrient deficiencies because mm -hmm. greening is a bacterial disease that basically plugs up the plumbing in a tree and causes the nutrient deficiencies. So I always ask people at very first, do you fertilize the citrus tree with a quality citrus fertilizer? And if they say, yes, I fertilize it a couple times every summer, I know it's mm, the yellow markings and the yellow spotting on leaves is probably greening. If they say, no, I never fertilize it, then it could be nutrient deficiency, could be greening. But greening is just so widespread that if you guess greening, you're almost always going to be correct. Mm. Unfortunately. Let's see. Question about, yes, palms do need fertilizer. And I'm going to let um, Bill answer exactly what kind. Yes, palm trees are very fussy with their micronutrients. So a lot of times when we see a palm tree and it has a problem, it is definitely a deficiency of magnesium, potassium. If they get a major deficiency in boron, 
they have really, really bizarre symptoms. Palm trees can do bizarre things. So very important that you fertilize several times every summer. Ideally, you can fertilize once a month if you fertilize very, very lightly and you want to start in the spring when your palm trees first start growing, keep fertilizing once a month up until the fall when your palm trees basically go dormant or stop growing. Fertilize very lightly. Use a high quality palm fertilizer that ideally has a lot of slow release nutrients because palm trees otherwise, the palm tree may be healthy and I heard this at uh, in-service training before on um, nutrients and fertilizers. Palm trees may be perfectly healthy and they can grow and they can flower, they can reproduce, they can do everything a palm tree wants to do, but they're not really pretty as far as we're concerned. So a palm tree can be healthy and not really pretty. We want to keep it really pretty. So because of that, you're going to have to fertilize and don't use cheap palm fertilizer because I've looked at some of them before and read the ingredients and they didn't have boron. They didn't have one or two other nutrients. I know that I go and buy a high dollar slow release palm fertilizer for my palms. You want to put the extra couple bucks into it. Good stuff. All right, so soil testing question. We're close to wrapping it up here. If you have any last questions you want to squeeze in the chat box there really quickly, Deborah Sue asks, how does one get their soil tested? Here in Hernando County, we don't do the actual testing. We send it off to Gainesville, University of Florida to get it done. But if you contact our office, we can give you the um, form that you need to fill out and all the information you need to get your soil tested in your yard. Yeah, I and think. if you're in a different county, check with your extension office. Some extension offices, like mine, do the pH test, um, but I'm not aware of any that do any nutrient test. Most of those will need to go up to Gainesville, but your extension office should be able to get you your paperwork. So if you're in a different county, you don't have to all bombard poor Bill over there in Hernando. You can spread the work out to everybody else. Yeah, I know we have people to tune in from, obviously, Pinellas County. Uh, we've had people from Broward County before. So double check with your county's extension office, and they can give you all the information you need. It's really very simple. It's either you take a sample to their office and they do it, or you fill out the form, you put it in a little box, you mail it to the soil testing lab in Gainesville, and they do it, and you get the results back in your email. Very, very easy to get done. And the nice thing as well is your county extension agent should also get a copy of the soil report. So when you get it and if you look at it and you said, I'm sorry, this is Greek, I don't understand it, you can call them and they can walk you through it. Yes, we get that too. But it goes to whatever county you live in. Mm -hmm. So if you get a soil test done and you mark down that you live in Pinellas County, the results of your soil test go to the uh proper agent there in Pinellas County. If you call me to explain it, I won't have access to the results. You can read them to me over the phone. So, um, Phyllis said that she did fertilize it regularly. I think Phyllis was talking about the uh, citrus trees. Citrus is another good example of you want to use a quality citrus fertilizer and fertilize your citrus with citrus fertilizer. Don't use lawn fertilizer, and don't use lawn fertilizer on uh, a palm tree because they don't like that. And be very, very careful with the use of weed and feeds, which we don't recommend anyway, they don't work very well. And any kind of herbicides you might be using to get rid of weeds in your lawn, be very careful using them anywhere near a tree, because sometimes, Everything's fine. doesn't affect the tree at all. Other times, it may affect the tree. And I have seen, what is it? The most sensitive is Palatka holly. And if you use an uh, herbicide anywhere near the root system of a Palatka holly, boom, you will knock all the leaves off of it. They only don't survive and come back, but it will damage the Palatka holly. So be very careful using herbicides and weed killers and those kind of things near a tree 
anywhere near the root system because it may damage it. And make sure you read the label because it will tell you if there's trees that you cannot use it around. Um, because I've seen where people use the wrong herbicide near an oak tree and killed it. And I've seen where they've used an herbicide around an oak tree and just spot damage the branches. We had a problem with that a few years ago. Like I said, palacahollies, I saw palacahalli sitting in a flower bed. And the very front edge of it out was St. Augustine turf grass. And they put down weed killer on the St. Augustine turf grass and all the leaves of that side of the palacahalli fell off. The leaves on the back side where the roots were growing into a flower bed where they did not put the herbicide were fine. Mm. So I, I had to actually go look at that one. I'm like, oh, this is an easy one. <laughs> I can tell you oh. exactly what happened here. I had an interesting call and I just want to do a PSA about something for everyone related to trees. So if you get lichens or those green growths on the side of your tree, they're completely harmless. And please never pressure wash your tree. Yeah, that was, hush, that was a new one for me. There's stump grinding right outside the window. Okay. Exciting day. Here we go. She said, this is Shelby. She wants to participate. Um, but yeah, okay. pressure My washing your trees is not a good idea. <laughs> What a beautiful dog. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so especially, so sh this was a crepe myrtle and crepe myrtles have very thin bark that also exfoliates. So by pressure washing it, you're likely damaging the growing tissue of the plant. Um, just like you don't want to pressure wash a person, you don't want to pressure wash anything that's alive. And that includes your, um, you know, your trees. I'm not even sure what to say about that one. As soon as I don't, I that was the best thing ever. I just, I'm glad it was over the phone because my mouth dropped. And it, but it was a great question, and she, she took the information, and she was really thankful. And I'm going to help her some more. But that was, that one shocked me because I, just, yeah, that was a surprise. If you write a blog post on that, please share that with me, and we'd be more than happy to share that. On our oh, that's a good idea. I'll do that for that can be my first blog post. Don't don't pressure wash your tree. <laughs> if you want, the two of us can start writing a series of blog posts on just some of the most bizarre things we've encountered. I think that could be fun. I think we could do that. I think that could be. Yeah, we'd have yeah. to write it carefully, but I think people would learn from some of the really unusual questions we've gotten. And some of the unusual things that we've heard about people doing. So yeah, and honestly, there's never a stupid question because that you if you got the question, at least one other person has the question as well. So it's always better to ask the question, get the information, and then you know. Exactly. She's never going to do it again. Um, but I mean, it's interesting too because that's not even something I would in my head. It's not something I would think somebody would consider. But clearly it is. So now, you know, it's an educational moment. I've never thought of that one. But real, real quick here, as we're kind of wrapping up, let me share probably one of the craziest ones that I've heard. And maybe you're familiar with um, palmetto weevils on palm trees. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered those yet? Not yet. Okay. Well, with palm trees in general, one of the few insect pests they get is a palmetto weevil. And palmetto weevils are big beetles. It's the largest weevil in um, the United States. And we do have native species of palmetto weevils here. So I was at the office and a gentleman popped in and he is a pesticide applicator. He had a company where he sprayed people's houses and yards and plants for different insect pests. And he said, I live I work here in Hernando County, but I live over in Lakeland. I live in another county, and I have a palm tree in my front yard, and it has palmetto weevils, and I sprayed it with, um, what's the pesticide they use for chinch bugs? Uh, Towstar. He said, I sprayed it with Towstar because it had palmetto weevils. I said, okay, well, how do you know it had palmetto weevils? He said, my neighbor told me. Okay, well, did your neighbor ever see the palmetto weevils? He said, no, 
but my palm tree was looking bad and it so it obviously has palmetto weevils so i sprayed it with tau star what do i do i said well how did you spray it he said i had the tau star in a hose head sprayer i was up on the roof and i drenched the top of the palm tree that way i said how did you know you have palmetto weevils he said because my neighbor told me i said did you ever see one he said no how do you know you had them i was told i had them. so he was on his roof giving his palm tree a drench with tau star which is a pretty serious um uh what is that that's either a neonic or uh, that's a pretty you know high potency pesticide and you know i guarantee you the label does not recommend that form of application and when your palm tree gets palmetto weevils they do they burrow into the growing tip of the palm tree and the grubs are pretty amazing we have some at our office that were dropped off where teresa is raising it's about they get about two three inches long it's a great big grub and just spraying insecticide on the top of your tree is not going to do it so i'm looking at them and i'm thinking you have a pesticide applicator's license and you're a professional and you're asking me this so yeah we get some pretty amazing questions and he's not following the label which is the law and you would think they would be the most likely to do it but we always have to remember remind people the label is the law read the label read the label and Valeria sent you some pictures of the dogwood and the red bud. So thank you so much. Thank you. I look at those. You're out with that. And Cindy said that they could, everybody could learn from some of our experiences. So yeah, we'll have to get together and do that. So, so yeah, that'll be fun. So we have been on here for a while. So let me wrap it up for this week and remind everybody that we will be back next week. Next week, I have a special guest on here. Dr. Mary Lusk, who is a University of Florida researcher who works with uh, water issues, who is an expert on septic systems, because I get to work with a little bit of everything. I work with Mary and a few other people. We put together a program to teach people about how their septic system works, how to get it checked, what not to flush, what you can flush, and all the different ins and outs with that. So save up all of your septic system questions for next week. And Dr. Mary will be on her, um, or she'll be on here on our uh, virtual plan clinic next week, answering everybody's burning questions on their septic systems. So one last question here or comment, Deborah Sue said, so even people who are professional lawn keepers and pesticides may not be trained in important things. They are trained, they are certified, but getting people to actually do things correctly can be a little bit of a challenge. That's why we're always stressing that to our master gardeners, always reminding them, check the label, the label is the law. You know, they put this information on labels for a reason, you wanna read it and stay within that because you're gonna get the best results in the end and you're gonna actually fix your palm tree instead of spraying insecticide all over your front yard and all over yourself standing on your roof which is probably not even the safest way to apply a pesticide that was pretty amazing he got a head shake for that one so hey everybody yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on here and jamie thank you so much for jumping in and joining us in a pinch here no problem. Thanks I'm sure for letting everybody me come. enjoyed. So until next week, we will see everybody then. Goodbye and everybody take care.